guys who switch one through five. It's not a lot of us. Me, Draymond, Giannis. Well, you did say you were like, I should have won the Defensive Player of the Year the last two years. You said that. I believe, believe that. Yeah, yeah. 100%. Uh, Why do you feel like you should have won over Rudy and Marcus? It has to translate. And I feel like Rudy in the playoffs didn't translate. All right, Bam. We've been talking about doing the sits down since, like, the bubble. <laughs> so I'm very happy that we made it happen. I was going to start this interview with something completely different, but now that I see the do-rag, we got to dive into a... <laughs> The barber habits of Bam Adebayo. It has to be one person. Yeah, it has to okay. be one person. And how Two do, max. Two how max. do you find them? Uh, well, I've had my same barber since, what, my rookie year? Because uh, going from Kentucky to Miami, I obviously had to get a new barber. And Juwan Howard actually recommended his barber. Uh, so ever since then, I like the way he cut my hair, and I never switched up. So now it's more particular, like now, obviously I got my money now. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> so now I can I can fly him paces if I really need him. Mm. And so, yeah, the Dewey is kind of, I'm looking a little rough today. Yeah, so, but we're uh, going to have it fixed. Yeah, we're going to have it fixed. Gonna it's going to be fixed. So Barbara flies out to you to cut your hair. And you mentioned, okay, if I will put these in advance because I know this is when I need my hair done. What are the cities that you said, okay. The cut has to be exactly what I need it to be. Uh, I would say going on the West Coast. So obviously the L.A.s, mm-hmm. uh, Brooklyn, New York. Um, hmm, what's some more cities? It's so funny because normally people would say Miami, but you're like, I'm always there. Yeah, I'm always there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's really it. Yeah. Oh, and the one I go home to Charlotte. Of course. So boom. It has to be all right. Yeah. I'm like fascinated by this because I wish I could just fly somebody out to do my hair once a week whenever I was going. That is not how it goes. That's why on Wednesday I'm going back to the locks because getting your hair done is just a whole... It's a whole shebang. But you do have that power. You just don't use it. But I don't do it because it's, it's, it's different money. You know what I'm saying? Fair. Fair. <laughs> yeah. It's like now you're like I'm flying them out. I'm figuring it out. You're a two-time all-star. Uh, you can you can do those kind of things. Speaking of, you know, we have to dive into uh, the all-star game. It's been a lot of opinions about if it was fun, if it wasn't, what can change, what we like. What was your opinion of the all-star game? Uh, I mean, it was... <laughs> What Jalen Brown said, glorified pickup. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, I mean, that's that's what it was. Uh, when was it? My my first All-Star in Chicago. I think when they first introduced the new rules, that's when I thought it got more competitive. Yeah. Uh, but this year it was more like... It was it was just like we was just getting cardio, light yeah. cardio today. There was no defense in sight. There None. was nothing. None. Okay, so I'm with you. I totally understand why players feel this way. You're going out there. You're just getting up shots. It's a show. I understand. But with that being said, how can it be fixed? Because it's the players that are on the court making the game. How can it be fixed? Uh, I mean, obviously the easy answer is... Dudes just got to play harder. I mean, that's the easy answer. But, uh, I mean, now you have guys that are, they're like the franchise guy. And it the franchise guy wasn't what it was back then. Like a franchise guy, a franchise guy now is like $200 million worth. Uh, so I feel like a lot of teams want to protect their – Hundred million dollar, two hundred million dollar asset. Yeah. Uh, so I feel like that's the the line that makes it difficult mm-hmm. to be serious in an All Star game because it's like we need you for the season, but we want you to enjoy like your accolade, like sure. that you deserve. Um. So yeah, it's a it's a thin line. Yeah. You know, and you're right when you talk about Chicago when they added that Elon Mending, obviously played to the target score plus twenty four. 
that does add an intensity and a competitiveness to it because you have to do it in this quarter. I just wonder if there is a way to have some sort of target in every quarter. And it's about winning quarters. Mm. You know? That could maybe add something to it. Yeah, I mean, technically, we do have that because it's a target score at the end. Yeah, but then you only really play because you know you have to win in the end. But, like, what if you have to win every quarter? Do you get what I'm saying? So how would you do the substitutions? Like, would you? No, you would sub out the same way, but it's like, okay, first quarter, it's the first, like, team to get to this score. Oh, uh, to 50. Or yes, like, like that. Okay. And so then you are having to work hard because every quarter does matter as opposed to you just get the plus 24 in the fourth. I don't know how it would work. I need to flesh it out a little more. But if that's what we like about the fourth quarter right now, what if we just kind of add it to all the quarters? I'm not against it. Yeah. We should start the campaign. (laughs) You're like, no, I don't like it that much. Jamal Crawford and I also think that on Saturday nights there should be a one-on-one competition Mm. that is added. Two divisions, six, four and under, six, five and up. You challenge. Do you think that guys would really decide to, okay, I'm going to put my pride on the line here? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh, I get think, excited. I think guys would get more excited about one-on-one than they would in, like, the actual All-Star game. Yeah. Honestly, because that's when guys feel like they're the freest. When they, when they have, it's just one-on-one. There's nobody else around us. It's just me and you in a basketball. And uh, it's kind of like pickup but it's different when you know somebody else is getting scored on in the all-star game uh, <laughs> it's a lot different when you go on the like five and it's you versus him yeah but it would be so fire what matchup would you like to see matchup uh hmm. all time or just right now current yeah current I would say JT and Jalen Brown. We kind of got a taste of that. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, and those are some of the best moments of the All-Star game. But that would be nice. Who would you challenge if you got called up to do the one-on-one at All-Star Saturday? Uh, Let me see who's on the All-Star team. I don't know. At that point, I feel like they should just do a pull. And, and just, just take whoever. Just pick from a hat. Yeah. And it's you versus you. And then you start the game. Same way we did it with the uh, the All-Star game. Mm-hmm. You pick your team, they just pick out a hat and see who go to one-on-one first. So you're saying if this competition got added, you'd be all in. You would do one-on-one. Yeah. Okay. I like that. <laughs> you're like, uh-oh. Hey, we, we have it on tape, you guys. You add this. Bam is... Signing up to do it. I think it really would add something nice to it. I enjoy All-Star Weekend, but I understand why there's so many other things that happen that make players feel tired, so many media requests. Like, you're having to do a lot. So they are going to have to spice it up some way, and I think this could be a a fun way. It won't be next year. Yeah, years on, years on. Is there an All-Star? Because obviously you all spend so much time together. Is there an all-star that you walked away from that weekend feeling like you knew more about? You just learned more about them? Learned more about them. Uh, hmm. Not specifically a player, mm-hmm. but uh, the Boston Celtics head coach. Oh, okay. Uh, so the guy I do meditation with, uh, I started doing it this year. And it's helped me uh, just for clarity wise. He is best friends with the Celtics head coach. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he just walked up to me. He said, "Man, tell me, tell me some like about you. Just I just want to get to know you. Like since it's All Star Weekend, we're here." Uh, and I was like, "Yeah, man, I'm starting to meditate." And it just seemed like that was just a highlight of our conversation. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> it's funny because they've been cool for like. 12 years or in some change. And I've known Russ since probably my second year in the league. Uh, but I never took meditation serious until now. And uh, Russ is who is doing leading meditation. Yes. Okay. Uh, 
and it was just it just comes full circle because like I never would have thought he would have said that like nah Russ is my best friend and I was like kind of like really <laughs> yeah uh, he was like yeah man we've been best friends since I think he was like a college head coach um so yeah I wouldn't say a player it was definitely a head coach though okay Mazzola. I like that why did you start meditating and how has it helped you uh just because, you know, in the basketball world today, it's a lot of it's a lot of it's a lot of bad energy pointed towards you in certain certain days, certain games, uh, certain performances, mm-hmm. and it's one of those things where like I never wanted to keep trying to chase like a, a high. Uh, I wanted to be more at peace. Um, and just not go with the flow, but just have a a consistent uh, consistent feeling by myself. And I think meditation going into the game, because, you know, it'd be some games I'd be super hyped for. So, like, my anxiety be up, like, game be going, and I feel like I'll get in my head. Uh, and meditation kind of, like, really calmed that down and gave me, like, a sense of clarity. And uh, now I, it's like... It's kind of like I'm going to play pickup. Like, I'm going to hoop now. Uh, Back then, it was more so like this is my job. I got to perform. This, that, and the third. Like, it just gave me anxiety with it. And now it's more level-headed and more consistent. So you meditate right before the game. So when we say right before, give me that. Right before, I say if it's 90 on the clock, I meditate around... 65. That's great. Yeah, give me like a five, six minutes meditation. Uh, get my ankle tape. And it's time to go. So what did you have to release about yourself to get this clarity? I had to believe that it'll work. That was the first thing for me. Because uh, before I used to look at meditation, I would try it on my own. But I'd be like, man, this isn't helping me. Uh, and... You know, getting with Russ, he was like, nah, you actually got to, like, believe in it. Like, Mm -hmm. and once I started believing in it, they be like, I give it, like, the first three games I really started, like, getting in the rotation with it. I could feel my mind just, like, go to, like, a, 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 it was steady. It wasn't any, like, I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking about this, this, like, if I miss a shot, uh, turnover. It was more so like, nah, just play the game. Uh, so now it's kind of, kind of mellowed out my uh, my anxiety. I mean, it sounds like this is something that has very positively changed your life. Uh, the ways that you're talking about it. What did meditating teach you about Bam? Man, uh, I'd be having a lot of stuff on my mind at one time, trying to focus on one thing, but my mind be. I'll think about this, I'll think about that. And then it'd be, and then I'll get distracted. So it's like, all right, I forget about this, then move on. Uh, But it just helped me, like, really start to, like, zero in on one thing instead of, all right, you know, I'll be in the middle of the game and it's like, ah, I got to get my hair cut tomorrow. I got an event in two days. Um... We down, we down two, and I gotta make these free throws because it's in the fourth. Uh, just my mind be everywhere instead of focusing on the main thing. And I feel like meditation has came, brought me to like a steady, a steady place where like now I can zero in. And you feel like you have that clarity and that peace that you you were talking. about? Yeah. So now it's not. I don't try to like ride my highs or like. And try to try to keep it this way. Like mm-hmm. it, it's kind of like expected, expected. Like I know the season's gonna be like this, so it's just for me mentally, just try to be as even kill as possible. I mean, it's hard just generally in life, not just in basketball, to not want to chase the high of things. For sure. And so that I think is probably the biggest hurdle that anyone would have to jump over. But you have made that switch. When in your career were you chasing that high? Uh, after my first All-Star, 
Um, and what was the high for you? It was just having, first it was my first All-Star. Yeah. So it was kind of like, you know, you get considered the top 24 in the league. It's like mm-hmm. you feel like you're one of them. Uh, so I just tried to, like, just chase that. Like, if I be an All-Star, like, every year, like, I, like I'm I'm devoting myself to that. And it, it became, instead of trying to chase that, uh, just more so, like, worry about the game. Like, you know, after that, it was kind of like I just bought in my mind, like, nah, I need to be an All-Star every year to, like, solidify like a good a good year for me Mm -hmm. um and I guess when I started meditating it kind of it was kind of like dog you ain't got to chase that like just your your game will speak for itself yeah and it has to your credit I'm sure you probably felt like a bit of a maybe a flip switched once you decided to shift your focus to certain things. Um, And I am not trying to get you back onto the chasing of the high, but I do want to talk about how crazy it has been watching your career. But also this past All-Star, because I was just talking to my friend about this, when you all were sitting in that locker room, right, in Utah, I think 19 (laughs) of you were 30 or under. 19 of you were 30 or under. 12 of you, 26 or under. Were you kind of looking around thinking, okay, is this starting to be those moments where this becomes our league? Yeah, you can, uh, I can definitely understand. I can definitely see that, yes. Uh, Sitting around, because now you see younger guys. um, You know, you got guys who obviously LeBron, KD, Kyrie, you know, they've been through this. They've been on that path, so for us, I do feel like it's starting to it's starting to change. Uh, this the torches are starting to be passed, and it's uh, it's starting to be the end of some eras. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I feel like we're we're next in line. So what is it like being on the court and playing basketball during this kind of tweener moment? Uh. life lessons um obviously from the older guys who are in the all-star game you can talk to them or ask them about the multiple all-star games they've been in and mm-hmm. how the game was then versus now and then you got the the new guys like Darren Fox who is his you know I've known him since we were probably 12 mm-hmm. uh this past all-star was his first yeah. So, like, seeing his opinions on it and then versus listening to somebody like Kyrie or or Braun uh, and how different the the attitudes are towards it. Mm, give me an example. So, like, for me, my first one, I wouldn't say starstruck, but it was kind of like, like, it's, it's only 24 of us here. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. it was kind of like, I would used to watch this on TV. Now I'm in it. And, you know, as a first timer, you don't know what to do, where to go. Uh, you have all these lists of appearances, meetings, uh, media, practice. And I feel like your day is more so involved with that than, you know, realizing you got to play the game on Sunday. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I feel like guys like, who get older, like, they have done all the media, they've done all the practice, they know the routine of All-Star, uh, and they can kind of gear themselves up for the game more. Uh, I feel like that's the, the the experiences, I feel like, is, the, is yeah. the difference. Just how they're taking it in yes. is differently. Yes. Okay, no, that makes total sense. So when you think of the older guys, and just generally, not All-Star, just the league in general, how will you know that that torch has been passed? Mm. When LeBron James retires, I feel like that's when the torch is officially passed. Mm. Explain. Uh, I mean, first of all, he just beat Kareem. Uh, Well, he's been in this league 20 years now and counting. And I feel like if they ever debate best player in in the game, 
until he leaves, you know what I mean? Like, people can say, like, we have this opinion, we have this opinion, but somebody's going to always be like LeBron James. <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> until he leaves, I think that's when people are going, going to start being like, nah, this one guy is mm-hmm. the best player. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, until he leaves, I don't think there will really be, a, like, a set-in-stone answer. Yeah, so that changing of the guards and that new era, you feel like goes through whether LeBron is playing or whether he's not. I think that's very fair. Yeah. It's really interesting, too, because, you know, when you're in a moment, you don't necessarily realize that you're living in the moment. And I think that LeBron, for a lot of people, once he passed Kareem, it was like, oh, no, no, this is what we're going to be talking about in those, like, yes. 50 years. It's yes. like LeBron is that person. But, you know, this is all cyclical and history repeats itself continuously in this league. So when LeBron is done and we have these other years, who becomes the LeBron of the NBA? Because it has to be someone. Mm. Uh, I would say next up, uh, I think it's Giannis. I like that answer and agree. But Giannis is one person that is somewhat of a tweener. Like, you can't really say he's in, like, the young group, but he's not in the old group. But he's done so much in his, in the span of his career. Absolutely. Like, Absolutely. I feel like it gives him the the say-so to say, like, he's he's the best player. Yeah. No, I agree. I think that when it comes to, like, being the best player, when LeBron's done it, totally is Giannis. But he's going to have this kind of, he'll be in two eras at once, in the best way. Yeah. Yeah. But what makes Giannis so good for people that don't completely understand? Uh, I mean, he's seven foot, first of all. <laughs> yeah. like, it's seven one. Uh, and I think the thing that really got him on the scene was when he would just take off from, like, the free throw line. Or he'll get down the court in, like, three dribbles and dunk it. Uh, just very 2K-ish. <laughs> if that makes sense. It's, it looks very unreal. Uh, and I feel like that's the thing that put Jordan over the top. You know, that's what put Kobe in that. In that um, Braun is like they had this special, I'm not going to say swag, but it was like this special gift they only had mm. uh, that just made them different from everybody else. Mm-hmm. And I feel like the fact that he can two two step through four people and dunk the basketball is like people think it's like boring now, but like that is really like <laughs> different. Yeah. Uh so yeah. And with Giannis too, you almost like you feel it. You feel it when he steps on the court. Also, I'm gonna give you a chance, clear this up. Viral video. Giannis says winner winner chicken dinner. <laughs> Camera zooms in on you. <laughs> Did you not think it was funny? Did you not hear it? What was the face? I didn't hear it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what's funny. I didn't hear it. Uh, I'm sitting here talking to Dame, and obviously you watch it. But as soon as me and Dame start stop having a conversation, I guess he says, what did he say? He said, winner, winner, chicken dinner. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah. So uh, the next day I'm getting all these DMs like, dog, like you're hilarious. And I'm like, what, what are we talking about? And it was like, just watch his face. And I was like, yeah, that did look bad. <laughs> yeah, because you went like, <laughs> but okay, so it cleared up. You think winner, winner, chicken dinner is a funny thing to say? I think for him, yes. Yes, okay. For him, there yes. There we go, internet. Internet sleuths. <laughs> he didn't even hear it. Okay, I love it. All right, let's turn our attention to you. You have said that you are the best defender in the NBA. Make your case. I mean... I guard one through five. Uh, you see it day in, day out, like legit one through five. I switch everything. Uh, I mean, yeah, like there's what What do you need me to do on the defensive end? Uh, <clears throat> I feel like that's the that that's the most I can give myself. Mm-hmm. Um, but what else you need? Is it? frustrating for you when you aren't a finalist is that something that really bothers you uh it did not anymore Mm -hmm. uh 
just because it was it was something I was chasing. Uh, and it bothered me just because I was chasing it. I felt like people were disrespecting me because uh, I felt like obviously nobody was a better defender than me in the league. But <clears throat> it, it doesn't bother me anymore because now, like I said, I play the game. Uh, you know, I go out there, I compete with my teammates, and I have complete clarity. Mm-hmm. And uh, focus focused on the game. Yeah. So now it's something that like you want to win, but you don't think you're defined by whether or not you win, and it's not something you're thinking about when you step out there. Yeah. Yeah. Now I just my game gonna do the talking. Mm-hmm. So, just going off of that, what do you think should be the things that we all think about when we are, you know, placing our votes for Defensive Player of the Year? What is that criteria for you? Do you think there should be any sort of stipulations around the award? Uh, obviously, I feel like obviously people are going to say missed games. Mm-hmm. Which is very fair. Yeah. Which is fair. Uh, I just think, though, I don't think stats, like you, should, you shouldn't only look at stats when it comes to DPOY. Because... Mm-hmm. A lot of times a guy might not have 60 blocks, but they might have the number one they might have the number one defense mm-hmm. or they might protect the paint. They might be number one in protecting the paint. Uh so for me, I don't think it's just blocks, steals, uh if you want to consider charges. Uh it's more so like how is the team when he's on the court mm-hmm. and they're playing defense versus when, like, he's off? Absolutely. Uh, so I feel like those are need to be in this situation rather than looking like, oh, well, he had five blocks today. Well, he could have had five blocks but also given up Yeah. 60 points. Uh, I feel like that matters. No, I think that's super fair. And I, when I had Draymond on the show, he said something that I always think about, which is, we should judge defense the same way that we judge offense. And what defensive situation do you need this person to be on the floor? And he's like, people get too caught up in like what these numbers are, but the stats and the analytics and all that was never meant to be looked at solo and in a vacuum. It's like you have to just add that to things like the eye test. Like all of that is a part of what defense is. But how do you think we get away from that? Because it feels like it is kind of taking over how – People watch the game. Uh, I feel like just because when, obviously, when everybody goes to the, to the end of the game or if they check the box score, they're looking at points, and then they're like, oh, this guy has five blocks. Uh, and he had three steals. Okay, you know, he's our DPOY. You know, that's how the agenda starts. You know, he's Which is, DPO. like, nonsensical. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But <clears throat> if people actually, like, really watch the games, mm-hmm. uh, I feel like that's how they get more of an understanding of situations that our players are put in. Mm-hmm. Like, I feel like guys who switch one through five, it's not a lot of us. Me, Draymond, Giannis, uh, who else? I'm going to let you say your list. I don't want to interject my opinion. <laughs> nah, it's fine. Uh, well, last year, what, Marcus Smart won. Year before that, Rudy won, right? Yeah, Rudy. but Rudy can't. Ru- yeah, anyway. You say Rudy, no? Nah. Well, you did say you were like, I should have won the Defensive Player of the Year the last two years. You said that. You I believe, believe that. that. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Uh, Why do you feel like you should have won over Rudy and Marcus? It has to translate. And I feel like Rudy in the playoffs didn't translate. Mm. Uh, and Marcus Smart guards went through four. You're like, I got them all. Exactly. Uh, so that's the that's the thing that I think I thought was different um, between me and them. Okay. That's fair. So then how do you make that leap this season, just defensively. I know it's not a thing you're chasing, but if you're just working on being a better player every day, how do you get people 
to think of you when they think about DPOY and not a Marcus or, you know, a Rudy in that year? Uh, they got to watch our games. <laughs> <laughs> That's the biggest thing. And obviously we're not one of them teams that always get always play on TV. Uh, so we don't get national exposure as much as other people. We are Miami. But yeah, I'm like, le- yeah, I, I hear you, but let's like. Be serious. I hear you, but you all also do be playing on TV, though. Not a lot. Okay, fair. I didn't say we didn't play on yeah, TV. Yeah, yeah, We don't play on TV. Fair. Then more than most. Fair. Uh, so I feel like that is also another layer. Um, but other than that, I mean, really, people just got to watch the games. Bam saying, tune in, y'all. <laughs> Okay, speaking of the Miami Heat, uh, are you going to create some fucking space for Kevin Love? (laughs) Is that on the agenda? Yes. Uh, (laughs) Yeah. Uh, It's funny because I've known Kevin for what, going on three or four years now. Uh, He was one of the people where, like, I made my jump. Um, It was my second year. I think it was my second year, the end of my second year, he started noticing, like, I was becoming, obviously, a better player, and I wasn't just on the defensive side. Uh, I was gaining more more offensive game. And he wanted my jersey. And it was just crazy to me that, like, obviously he's won, and, you know, multiple All-Stars. Uh, and let's not forget Minnesota Kevin Love. Exactly. So I thought it was dope that, like, dang, like, Kevin Love wants my jersey. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> and then from there, I seen him in the Olympics. He was with us uh, for the start. Uh, and obviously getting to talk to him a little bit, mm-hmm. this and that there. But now he's on the team. Yeah. So good to have him. No, Create some space for him. <laughs> Create some space for him. Why is Kevin Love, like, that exact big for you? Uh, IQ, uh, <clears throat> and I feel like he's been around this league. He's a vet. Uh, he's been in those those situations where obviously they were down. What was it? Three one. Three one. Come back and win. Uh, being a part of that, that's an experience. I feel like K Love has you know those experiences that guys like myself and my teammates want to be a part of, which is win a championship. Yeah. Um, so obviously he, he fits that mold for us. Just he knows that experience and how to get there. Mm-hmm. No, I first off, you should always ask, and you probably know this, whenever you all go somewhere, you should ask Kevin which wine y'all should get. He always will pick the exact perfect wine. Really? He, like, has a wine. He, like, you know, he's a big wine guy. But okay. just a, a tip for when you all are your team outings with uh, okay. with Kevin. Always ask him the why, and he'll always know. I was reading a quote from Jimmy, actually, talking about the Heat team and some of the struggles, and he just said, I'm tired of losing. He's like, we have to get it fixed very quickly. Where are you at mentally with the state of the team right now? I mean, I agree with him. Uh, n- n- nobody's, like... Nobody's comfortable with losing. Uh, Well, in our locker room, nobody's comfortable with losing. So, you know, when you go two, three games in a row, four losses, uh, it starts to wear on you. Um, And obviously we're one of those franchises, like, we we like wins. Yeah. So we want to win every game if possible, need be. Uh, And I feel like the struggles come from we let a lot of games go that we should have won. And we just let them slip. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's the, the up and down of the season. You know, like, we struggle making shots sometimes. Sometimes shots go in. Uh, so it's more so I, I agree with them. Yeah. How much pressure do you feel to right the ship? Uh, I mean, as being one of the cornerstone guys of yeah. the organization you want to win so when you're on a losing streak like it's for me you know I just take it upon myself to be like nah like we got to figure this out Mm -hmm. uh and it's not only me like I try to bring my teammates with me uh 
So, like, if I'm performing, like, I try to get all my teammates involved so we can all get comfortable and go out there and get us a win. Mm -hmm. As you've progressed in the league and you understand more, you get more experience, how do you personally deal with losing? Uh, Man, it still keeps me up at night because it's like it's certain segments of the game or certain plays in the game that, you know, they just run through your head all night. Uh, so now I can meditate. Uh, I do a better job of meditating before I go to bed so then, like, I can get a good night's sleep. That's smart. What do you use to meditate? Is it just Rust? Do you use, like, any of the apps? What do you do? So he got me an app, and it's called Vision Pursuit. Okay. And it's uh, it basically takes you step by step on meditation. Mm -hmm. uh, so what is it called? It's called C. It separates your emotions. E, expect it, expect it. And the last E is embrace. Uh, so it just teaches you step by step how to deal with certain stuff in your life, what you're going through. Uh, <clears throat> and at the end, it makes you do like a little journal. Uh, to review, like, how you felt, what you went through, the experiences you had, and how you used the the technique to get through it. Really? I love that what you said. What? Set expectations, embrace, and what was the other one? Uh, expect the expected. Expect the expected. Which tool do you find yourself using the most? Expect the expected. Okay. How so? Um... Uh, I mean, simple thing is, like, going into the season knowing, like, the season's going to be up and down. Yeah. Uh, so expecting that, you know, I feel like you're more prepared for it. Mm -hmm. So, like, if y'all do have, a, like, a shooting slump, you're not too sideways off of it or, like, you go through a little rough patch and you can't make shots. Like, mm -hmm. you're not too sideways about it. Yeah. Uh, or you come out the – you come out the gates hot, and it's like, nah, I'm trying to ride this the whole season. Mm -hmm. uh, it's more so just being prepared for, like, if you do take a dip, like, it's you can get back on your high horse. Okay, so I have to say, and I am not just saying this, <laughs> from when I, like, first met you to this moment, you do feel, like, just a lot more zen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Like, do you do you feel that? Yeah. I'm like, I'm talking to you like, wow, yeah, this is like we all need to be calm and have this clarity. And this isn't even just something that is happening in the basketball court. I'm saying you specifically, you just feel a bit more at peace and I think more so in tune with yourself. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Yeah. And it's it more so uh, being self-aware because mm -hmm. I know once I get around, you know, cameras, lights, like, my anxiety go up. Like, I know I'm like, all right, like, we, it's about to be showtime. Yeah. Uh, and that doesn't matter, like, if it's in here and we're doing this or it's stepping out in the court. Like, I don't think anxiety picks what to really be, like, up and roar about. Like, it's kind of like certain situations you get in, it just kind of kind of sparks. Yeah. Uh, and I feel like, you know, during meditation, I've done a great job of kind of, mellowing out and like not letting your environment dictate the bam that we get in that moment yes. it's just letting bam be bam and yeah. the environment adapt exactly to that no i think that's great i i really mean it i think it's great that you are really like being in tune and all the things and i'll i'll get off the meditation but i'm just <laughs> genuinely curious about it i gotta download the app uh okay but back to the basketball court when i say boston celtics <laughs> what emotion comes to mind ah uh. I don't like the Boston Celtics. <laughs> nah. Uh, and it's mainly because, uh, obviously, JT, I've known JT since we were 12. So, obviously, when we play each other, it's a dog fight. Like, yeah. I want to be like dog. Like, I have more wins than you. <laughs> like, that's that's how I am. It's a personal, it's a personal, it's a personal battle right there. Like, Nah, like, I want to, at the end of our careers, be like, well, when we played you this many times, and well, when we played each other, like, Bam has more wins, mm -hmm. including regular season playoffs, whatever you want to say. <laughs> I'm top dog. And that's what you're gunning for? Yep. So 
before and after those games, what are those texts like between you and Jason? Uh, before a game, I don't text Jason. I don't, I don't talk to Jason before games. Uh, but after games, it's more so, it's more so love because we played the game, buzzer went off, win, lose, a draw. Like <clears throat> he's still one of my, one of our, one of my great friends in the league. So mm-hmm. it's all love at that after the buzzer go off. Mm-hmm. But before that, no, nah, I'm not talking to you. <laughs> um, no, nah, I'm not cool with you. Yeah, you're like, we're not friends here. No. I was reading an article where someone was talking to you just about, you know, the Heat Celtics rivalry, and you said some people just don't get it. They don't get it. What don't people get about that rivalry? It's got so much history with it, and I feel like it started from the big three. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you've seen those battles. You've seen how ugly it get. Like, you seen when Ray went from Boston to Miami, how, like, they kind of, like, I'm not going to say turned on him, but, like, that's how it was back in the day. Like, yeah. you with them now. Like, mm-hmm. we don't fuck with you. Uh, so I feel like it's still, it's still there because, one, obviously, we still have UD. Yeah. So UD went through... <laughs> UD went through that. He's like uh, the godfather, I feel like. Yes, Just, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, like, when he explains the stories, like, of the game six Braun had, like, when he sp- explains the battles of the regular season, when he explains how they treated Ray when he came to the Heat, like, you start to develop, like, the the energy for it. And then also, like, going in Boston is not, you know, back in the day, it wasn't, it wasn't all cute and copacetic for right. for African Americans. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, obviously they add that factor into it. Like when you walk in, what is it called? The uh, what TD Garden? No, 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 the uh, Leprechaun. Oh, uh, Lucky. Yeah, <laughs> they uh, they really believe in that. Yeah, like they like so <clears throat> going in there and like. Getting a win, like, with us is, like. <sighs> Would you say that's, like, that's the most personal game? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's the most personal game for us. So what does it bring out of you specifically? Because I mean, you tend to perform. <laughs> 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 it's one of those things where <clears throat> it's just. It's the it, it's the environment. Like you can, as soon as you step in the arena, and we're like, it's it's Boston versus Miami. No matter what the seasons it is, yeah. like, all right, this might be a dog. This is gonna be a dog fight. Yeah, you're hyped talking about it yeah, right now. I, yeah, like I like my blood get going. Uh, yeah, because I enjoy that game so much. Because obviously, like across from me is like, like I watched. JT when he was 12. Like, we were both 12 at the mm-hmm. time. Like, I watched Jalen Brown. Me and me and Grant Williams competed against each other in, in college. Uh, me and who else was on that team? Uh, Robert Williams competed against each other in college. So, like, it's a lot of, like, we've crossed each other's paths before. So, like, yeah. we know of each other or know each other. Mm-hmm. Uh, and obviously – I'm. I like to talk my shit. So like, mm-hmm. when we win, like that's the first thing JT hear, <laughs> and it's yeah. and it's vice versa. So, yeah. <laughs> so like with those games, it's like, nah, you better bring your A game because if I win, I'm talking this shit. Yeah. Are you a big trash talker just generally? Nah. But that one. Yeah, that one. That one. That one's personal. Yeah, that one you got to get going. Yeah. I mean, it's super interesting though because obviously when you are looking at the conference, just. You think, okay, you're going to be facing the Celtics or the Bucks, like, come playoffs. When you look at the Eastern Conference as a whole, what do you see? Man, uh, it's a lot of, I would say, up, ups and downs in the East. Because, mm. like, you've seen, you've seen some, some teams go on 10-game winning streaks. But you've seen some lose seven in a row. <laughs> mm-hmm. Some people will go, man, unexpected, six in a row. 
and they'll lose five in a row again. Yeah. Uh, so I, it's kind of the the up and down battles of the season. Mm-hmm. And it, it's, I would say it's up for grabs. Uh, if it, you can figure out how to be the most consistent. Mm-hmm. Eastern Conference is up for grabs. If you can figure out how to be the most consistent. Who do you feel in the East is the most consistent right now? Right now? Because uh, they're on, well, I will say Boston and the Bucks. Yeah. Boston and the Bucks. yeah. When I interviewed DeJounte Murray, he was telling me about a conversation he had with LeBron about the East, and he agreed with this. He said LeBron told him the East was more physical than the West. Do you agree with that? In your experience, have you seen that? I don't play in the West often, so I yeah. can't I can't speak for that. Uh, do I feel the East is physical? Yes, I do. Mm-hmm. Uh, do I know if it's more physical? I don't know. Yeah. I haven't... Uh, I haven't been on the West Coast enough. Yeah, but you're like, it's physical in the East when I'm playing. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I don't know if you remember this, but you and I were talking about the bubble, and you said that there was one time you cried in the bubble, and it was when you all lost in the finals because you just felt like something was taken from you. When you'll think about winning a championship, is that one of the moments that you remember in your head? Yeah. Because it's... uh. The one thing about a championship, like, yeah, like, you remember, like, the glory, like, the fun, champagne, all that, but it was more so, like, the the journey of it. Uh, like, for example, like, the Olympics for us. Like, everybody know we won. It was great when we won, celebrated, but going through the fire of getting critiqued, Everybody saying, what's wrong with USA? Uh, people saying, like, we should have the USA ripped off our jerseys, off our chest. Uh, <clears throat> it was kind of like the whole country was like, what are y'all doing? And it was like going through that, like, people might think, well, it's just my one opinion. But, like, your opinion is with somebody else's opinion, added to somebody else's opinion. Uh so it was kind of like more so people wanted to see us fail just so they could be right. Mm-hmm. Uh, <clears throat> and I felt, you know, that journey was like, damn, like, it was cool that we won. But, like, do y'all remember how they how bad they was talking about us? <laughs> like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that, and that's, like, the conversations, like, you can always have with, like, I could always have that with a Draymond. Mm. Like, I can walk up and be like, dog, you remember when they was, like, really shit talking to us in the Olympics? And he and was like, what we did. And he's like, yeah, we got the gold medal, though. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I feel like that's what you, you you remember, like, the grind of it, the the ups and downs of it. So, yeah, I won a championship. I'm going to go back to when I was like, damn, like, I really cried in the bubble because we were there for, what, a hundred and... A long time. Exactly. <laughs> yes, a very so, long time. So you're there for a hundred and something days and then you get down to the final two and then obviously everybody else leaves. Mm-hmm. So it's just like you, you walk past your opponent every day on the way to breakfast. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like you take different buses but y'all see each other from across the parking lot. Yeah. Uh, but how big was it for you like getting that taste? Mm. Uh, one, because I had put, we put the Boston Celtics out. Yes. Uh, (laughs) uh, But two, it was just, it was surreal because, like, I watched so many greats play in the finals. And getting that opportunity to step on the court and see, like, the finals logo. And, like, when you go home, there is no other game on. Like, mm. you were the, in the game. Uh, so I feel like that is, like, what you remember about it most. Like, that's the that's the surreal taste of it. I also think, too, when you talk about, you know, that journey to the finals, what it takes to get there. In my experience, when people make it to the NBA and they've taken that journey, their opinion of the way that we talk about things like ring culture completely changes. 
did that happen for you? Yeah. How so? Yeah. I mean, 16 wins. That's that's what you need to get to a championship. And it sounds so easy. <laughs> like, when you think about it, if you was like, man, all you need is 16 wins. Like, you'd be like, that's it? Yeah. 16 wins. And I'm able to lose every series, possibly three. Yeah. You just got to get four wins each series. It sounds easy until you go through that gauntlet. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that's after the regular season. So now it's like you really got to be like, all right, it's all hands on deck at this point. Like there is no like, you know, I need a break. I need, you know, I can't go as hard. Like, no, nah, you need 16 wins. Mm-hmm. Uh, and preparing yourself for that is like, it's like, it feel like it's like a job at that point. Yeah. Because now it's zero focusing. Like there is no, I'm going to go to dinner. I'm going to hang out with my friends. Like there is no nothing. Because I know. Uh, you're trying to win it all. Nah, you're trying to win it all. Like yeah. everything gets zeroed out. I just feel like, you know, it would be hard. And we talk about chasing the high, right? It's like that would be what I would always be thinking about. I have to get back to feeling that exact thing. But that would weigh on a person pretty heavily, I assume. Uh, yeah, because you start, you start thinking about, like, you know, what it felt like to be, like, when I ran on the court and I seen the final symbol, it's like, dang, like, we got, we got 12 more wins, like, what it felt like to, you know, warm up and be the last two teams standing. And it's like, mm-hmm. at that point, you're four wins away from your goal. But it's like the hardest four wins ever. Mm-hmm. Um, like, it's one thing, like, I always say this since I've been in the playoffs now. The hardest thing to get is the fourth win. I feel like that is the hardest win to get. The mm-hmm. fourth win is the hardest one. Because it's like, that's when the other team is like, is is win or go home. Mm-hmm. Like, there is no, like, we got a second chance at this point. So that fourth win, that's the one that you really have to get past. Yes. Oh, I love it. I mean, obviously, I'll be rooting for you as you continue your career. Many, many playoffs, hopefully many finals. Yes. Um, I do have one last kind of section for you I want to talk about. Uh, because I was reading a really interesting article that you did for Anscape, and it was just about your name and how you have kind of come into understanding your roots and your heritage and all of this. What is your full name? Idris Adebayo. Idris Femi Adebayo. Say it again slowly so everyone can hear. Idris uh-huh. Femi Adebayo. And in this article, it is kind of discussing the journey that you have taken to understand, I guess, yourself. What have been some of the stops on that journey for you? Uh, I mean, first I had to really, because it started, obviously, like, I'm single parent. So it was always my mom. So I never really had a connection with my father. And he was Nigerian. So for a long time in my life, like, living with my mom, I didn't want to represent somebody that wasn't in my life. Mm-hmm. So, like, for a period of time, it was like, I used to try and hide being Nigerian. Obviously, it's harder to do because of my last name. But <clears throat> like it was kind of like, nah, like, I didn't really buy into it. Like, I wasn't like, it was kind of like, it took me a minute to be like, all right, this is really a part of you, my guy. Like, you got to <laughs> you gotta get in touch with it. Yeah. And it took me until, like, I was probably, like, 15, 16 to really be like, I my my last name's like uh I'm Nigerian like I'm starting to really under not understand it but like I'm starting to lighten up on like you know people asking me if I'm Nigerian or not mm-hmm. I'm starting to more so now open up and be like yes yeah instead of being like nah like you know I don't really claim it because like my parent was one of my parents wasn't in my life that held that Nigerian. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> so for me now it's more so like now I want to go to Nigeria yeah. now I want to see the motherland now I want to be a part of it because now and this is what social media has helped us like 
now you see the great things that like Africa has to offer for us. So many great things, yeah. Uh, so when I was younger, I I completely cut it off. Like I didn't want to have anything to do with it. And my mom, blessings to her because she's my pride and joy. Uh, Shout out to mom. Yeah, she was one of the people <laughs> that was really like, nah, like you really need to like start to understand like what your name means and like where you come from and you know this is these are your ancestors and like how you need to get in touch with the motherland Mm -hmm. um so yeah she was always on me about it and I used to always be like nah I'm good like I don't I'm good like I don't I don't need that right now like he's not a part of our life why do we need to worry about it Mm-hmm. And that was kind of how I thought about it as a youngster. Mm-hmm. So now me being older, more so is like I need to see the other side of the world now at this yeah. point. Yeah, and uh, you're like, I'm proud. Yeah. yeah, so now it's like I'm proud to be like, nah, I'm Nigerian descent. I love that. Uh, so it's it's a sense of pride now because now you see how hard some people work to like make a name for themselves. Uh, and they want their name to hold weight. Mm-hmm. Uh, so now, you know, more so instead of a 15-year-old kid really running from, like, what he what he has, uh, now more so, like, I'm open to it. Uh, I'm open to learning about my last name. I'm open to going to Nigeria and seeing the land. <clears throat> so for me, it's just, <clears throat> it's just going to add another another layer of my life that I can expand on mm-hmm. and uh, be comfortable talking about. For sure. Because name and identity are just so personal to people that I, I can understand why you'd kind of have this push and pull of, okay, what does this mean to me based on my relation to him? And how were you kind of able to grapple with the relationship with your dad and also wanting to learn? Uh, I had to... I had to understand that what he had going on and what his situation was, it couldn't affect me. Uh, So even though he wasn't in my life, I couldn't. Now I think about it, it was dumb for me to be like, all right, that's it. Like, fuck him, fuck the name. Like, Mm -hmm. it used to be times I used to tell my mom, like, can I get it changed? Like, could I have your last name? Like, that's how I used to talk to my mom, and she'd be like, no. <laughs> yeah. And thank God she didn't listen to me <laughs> as a 15-year-old. Uh, <laughs> but now it's more so, like, <clears throat> I had to forgive and kind of, you know, just think about the brighter days about it. Like, all right, you wanted my life. I let it go. That don't mean you got to come back. <laughs> mm-hmm. But it was more so like I just let that 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 inner beef that I had, I just let it go. Mm. And I'm sure that lends to the self-awareness yeah. and the clarity and the peace and the meditation. It all comes full circle. <laughs> all right, last question for you. What if you weren't an NBA player, what would you be doing? If I, am I still this tall? Yes, you're still you. Okay, I'm You're, still You me. just cannot play in the NBA. Mm. When I was growing up, I wanted to be around sports, so I wanted to be a physical therapist. Okay. What if it's not sports adjacent? Okay. All right. <laughs> um, got me there. Uh, hmm. I don't know. Hmm. I will say you're giving me like life coach at this stage of not your life stage coach. Of your life. Uh, I mean, it's like you could teach meditation. No, nah, I can't teach. I no, can't you teach. don't think you could? No, 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 no. You're just like sports. It's it's within me. Yeah, it's within me. This uh, I don't know, man. I'll probably try to take on acting or something. I'll probably want to be in a movie. I don't oh, know. okay. Actor, bam. I love it. Also, I need to say this because I had this thought 
what, like a few days ago when De'Aaron and Malik went crazy? <laughs> Y'all were on the same team, if I remember correctly. I mean, what what happened? <laughs> that was a uh, lot of talent on one team. Uh, what happened? Yes, what happened? I mean, you just got to ask. You, you, <laughs> it's hard for me to say it because I don't want to sound like I'm hating because I'm not hating. That's one thing I'm not Say hating. it. What is it? But we going to all say we feel like we got cheated. Okay, explain. Okay, so referee that ref, the referee that refed our game, one referee, Cal was like one and like nine against with him refing our game. So obviously, we get in the game. Four out of our five starters have two fouls in the first half. So you know, college, you still play half. Yeah. So you get your first two, like, it's kind of like, all right, bro, like, we got to sit you into the second half. Yeah. And four of our five starters get fouls. And it's kind of, it, it kind of goes from there. Uh, mm-hmm. We fight back. Dude hits a crazy shot. Game over. Uh, after that, though, I guess the referee has, like, a, a roofing business. So, like, our fans just, like called in his lines, blocked his lines. <laughs> oh, no, gave him, like, one star on the One star Yelp reviews, <laughs> like, threatening him, like, to the point, like, you had to get law enforcement involved. Oh, no. Because it was that bad, because, like, yeah. obviously, with us, we're going to be like, all right, we got cheated, but uh, they won the game. So what? Whatever. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, so. You've been holding on to that. You're like, this yeah. is how I feel about That's this Kentucky feel. team. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I hey, feel like we would have won. Well, hey, you have another chance to win a championship in a different league now. There it so. is. I appreciate your time, Bam. I'm so happy we did this. I feel like I learned so much, and I'm going to pick up on this meditation. I think I hey, need Hey, man, it. you yeah. might need it. I got you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs>